made me feel like a kingdom kid, amen? I felt it in the first three rows at the beginning. I felt the vibes all the way up to this bronze chase row. And then I looked back in the middle of the song, and then I felt it up to Brianna and Tia and Regina back there. The sides in the back, hey amen. You guys got to get your, you guys got to get the spirit of a child back in you. Amen. I, uh, I'm excited to be back. It's been a while since I've been in the skyline. This is new. That's awesome. And Patrick killed it. Didn't even know the chords. I saw him figure it out. Took him five seconds. That was amazing. And uh, praise God. The title of my lesson today is Walking Temples. Walking Temples. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, verse 19. Now, my grandfather doesn't even really believe in the Bible like that. But he loves to read the Bible. Unfortunately, he may have read the Bible more than you. He's uh, 90 years old, and he still works out all the time. He, he, he's a doctor. And uh, he, he loves to quote this scripture to me all the time. 1 Corinthians 6. It's probably, it's probably his favorite scripture. Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. He says... The Bible says, not my grandpa, amen. Oh. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You may be seated. Wow, this, this my grandfather loves to drop this one on me. He says, hey, Johnny, you, you've been working out? I say, uh, no. He said, hey, don't you know what the Bible says about your body? And sometimes I mess with him. I said, body's a museum. Um, uh -oh. This is my body. A, uh... He said, no. no. Your body is the temple of God. Uh -huh. Come on. And then he really wants me to have those coconut shoulders. He's always talking about it, coconut <laughs> shoulders. But that was before I was married. And so uh, I think he hasn't brought up coconuts in a while. And so I think I'm content with my mango, you know, lemon lime shoulders. One day, I meant the coconut. Yeah. <clears throat> Look at James 4, verse 5. James 4, verse 5. Or do you think scripture say without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. Wow, how cool is that? That God wants the spirit in you. It says he caused it to dwell in you, and he wants it back. That's why God wants you to get to heaven. Did you know that? If you're a Christian, that's what, he wants you to get to heaven, and he, he wants the spirit with him. He sent it out for your benefit, but he wants that spirit back. Look at... Uh, yeah, that's what I was going to share. Ephesians 1.13, it says the, the Spirit is a deposit, a seal. It also says in 2 Corinthians 5.6, which our lovely Ashley and Joe Campbell shared, of course. They are in tune with the Spirit, and they knew I was going to say this today. And, uh, you know, the Spirit's a deposit. It's in you. James 1.15 says sin brings death. You know, the Spirit is full of life. In Ezekiel 37, it says, wherever the spirit goes, life goes. Yeah, come on. And we know that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Yeah. And so there aren't spirits in dead bodies. When you die, your spirit leaves. But you know you can be dead while you're alive. And there are many dead people walking around these days. And even there are some appearing to be like temples, wow, wow. but are not temples, wow. but are really dead inside. Wow. Romans chapter 8, on, verse 5. Come on, John. Preach. There, bro. Come on, Johnny. Come on. <clears throat> My evangelist said I have to preach no longer than 30 minutes, I think. Oh, <laughs> nice. And I lost track of time already. 
All right, Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. The mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Don't you want your mind run by the Spirit? The Spirit calls the shots. You know, there's so many anxiousness and anxiety and lack of peace and distrust and that is all not from the Spirit. That's a mind governed by the flesh, which leads to what? It says death. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. You guys didn't think I was going to go to 24. <laughs> You thought I was going to go to 19. Galatians 5.24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, don't we, church? Just testing if the Spirit's calling out at your voices. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. You know, you got to keep in step with the Spirit. The Spirit's fast, and it's going in all directions. The Spirit, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have feet here, okay? The Spirit can move very quickly. The Bible says you got to keep in step with the Spirit. What does that mean? Keep up with what the Spirit inside you is telling you to do. Sometimes we get really lax, don't we? And we just let the Spirit move on. And we let the Spirit tell us something, and we quench it, and we say no. Look at chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to, sp to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Amen. you're going off. Let us not become weary in doing good, right. for all for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Amen. Keep in step. Yeah. You cannot give up if yeah. you're in step. Yeah. You cannot stop if you're in step. The Spirit of God is hovering over the waters in Genesis, and it hasn't stopped since, guys. The Spirit is still trying to move out of you, through you, into you, around you at all times. You know, if you don't keep in step with the Spirit, you actually die. All those passages about the flesh and death being contrary to the Spirit, if you stop following it, you, you die. Decay in your bones, and your breath starts to stink, and your bowels are released. Amen. Death. Death. So uh, today I thought, well, we'll look at the temple in the, New Test in the Old Testament. And two, there's, there's two passages of scriptures I want to see in the Old Testament, and we have two points for you guys. And we're going to look at where they put the temple and why they put the temple where they put the temple. Go to 1 Chronicles 21. Come on. Because we want the temple to be us. Are you the walking temple, amen? Or are you the walking dead? 1 Chronicles 21. Verse 1. Walking temple or walking dead? <clears throat> now this is before the temple was made. David had the idea to make a temple. And then this happens in verse 1. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a sentence of Israel. In Exodus 30... It talks about, it, the Bible warns us that you could get a plague if you don't take the census the right way, the way God desires wow. it. And David, in short, did not do it God's way. Verse 2. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the troops, Go and count the Israelites from Beersheba to Dan and report back to me. 
But Joab replied, May the Lord multiply his troops hundred times over, my lord the king. And are they not all my lord's subjects? Why does my lord want to do this? Why should he bring guilt on Israel? The king's word, however, overruled Joab. So Joab left and went throughout Israel and then came back to Jerusalem. Joab reported the number of the fighting men to David in all Israel. There were one million and a hundred thousand men who could handle a sword, including 470,000 in Judah. But Joab did not include Levi and Benjamin in the numbering because the king's command, it was repulsive to him. This command was so evil in the sight of God, he punished Israel. Then David said to God, I've sinned greatly by doing this. Now I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a foolish thing. The Lord said to Gad, David seer, go and tell David, this is what the Lord says, I'm giving you three options. Now this is scary right here. You, when God comes to you and says, you have three options. Like you're like, oh my gosh. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So Gad went to David and said to him, this is what the Lord says, take your choice. Three years of famine, take your choice. Three months of being swept away before your enemies with the swords overtaking you or three days of the sword of the Lord, days of plague in the land with an angel of the Lord ravaging every part of Israel. Now when, now then, decide how I should answer the one who sent me. Point number one is vain vanity. Look at what kind of punishment David gets for his vanity. In, in numbering God's people in a, a way that God didn't want him to do, yeah. it was exposing his vanity because he wanted to see how much power he had going outside of what God wanted him to do and how God wanted him to do it. You know, vanity is uh, very common in our, our society. I mean, constant selfies. I mean... What is vanity is it's thinking about yourself. What is to do something in vain mean it's useless? It's useless to think about yourself. You waste so much time thinking about yourself. You waste so much time thinking about how you're going to be seen when you do something. You don't even do it. That's all just vanity. Now, there's some, sometimes we confuse uh, this word introverts with vanity. Oh, I'm just an introvert. But sometimes it's not really introversion, right. it's selfishness. Yeah. Yeah. It's I'm so afraid of what everybody else looks at me. Yeah. That's called vanity. Yeah. Sometimes we look at all our accomplishments, or in David's case, everything you've done and everything you have, and you feel really good. Is that your source of comfort? Everything you have in your life? Or is your comfort come from God? Vanity is in vain because it will all be punished. Philippians says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. That our life needs to be in total sacrifice for Jesus. Now, in, in opposite of this, you see the first example of where God chooses to put the temple. Turn to Genesis. Genesis chapter 22. Go, <clears throat> Verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. And go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. On a mountain, I will show you. This mountain is where they end up putting the temple. Wow. 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 Yeah. Did you know that God chose this mountain to symbolize sacrifice for all our life? Where vanity is all about taking and what, how I look and what I get, but sacrifice is all about giving. Yeah. The key in being a walking temple and worshiping God is, are you a living sacrifice? Wow. Is your life sacrifice? 
I find very, it's, it's easy to get offended and hurt and bothered when my life isn't on the sacrificial altar. It's easy to feel hurt when I'm not a sacrifice. It's, but it's very, when, when I'm like, man, my life is nothing. I'm just a servant of the Lord. Yeah. Then I could get hurt. Then it doesn't even bother me. Sorry, I don't know what's going on with this mic. What should I do? Should I come back? Should I whisper? All right. Stay right here. <clears throat> is that better? Yeah. All right, sorry, guys. It's okay. We love you. That better? Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> okay. You need to be a sacrifice is what it comes down to, family. Yeah. What is, is there any area of your life you just want to hold your grasp on? Living sacrifice, and maybe it was you at once, but you always, a walking temple means, you know, the temple continually had sacrifices. And that's why God wants his spirit in us, because you're going to be continually sacrificing. I want to lift up some brothers. I think Dalton sacrificed huge. Dalton f was 15 years old, amen, three weeks ago. He was in the tent with me in a Walmart parking lot in West Virginia, yeah. eating chicken from a can. Every day. Uncomfortable, sleeping on the concrete. He's 15 years old. Yet there were some adult Christians who didn't want to sacrifice that. Talk about it, Johnny. Wow, but Dalton at 15 years old would do it. I appreciate Chris Adams. Chris, in his old age, was living in the tents. I appreciate this young man, Lewis, who wants to get baptized today. Turn off the mic. I can just, yeah. I can just preach. Lewis, Lewis is a man of great ambition, but yes. today he made sure he said it's all for God. Yeah. And he gives this idea. He says I'm willing to give it up for God. And, I, and, he, and it wasn't really too difficult. He was very quick to respond, and, <laughs> and that's why he's getting baptized today. And he, Go back to First Chronicles, chapter 21. First Chronicles, chapter 21. We'll look at the punishment here. Verse 13, David said to God, I'm in deep distress. Let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is very great, but do not let me fall into human hands. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell dead. And God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem, but the angel was doing so. The Lord saw it and relented concerning the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying the people, enough, withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then standing at the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. Wow, 70,000 people died. 70,000 people were destroyed by this angel. And once again, you see God... David knew. He said, God's more merciful than man. Yeah. Don't, doesn't that feel good to know? Yeah. Yeah. That God's more merciful than man. <laughs> that you can even find somebody who's merciful and God's more merciful than that. Right. And sometimes we just look at each other with such worldly perspectives. Yeah. And such, such evil intent in our heart. And maybe, maybe we just don't think spiritually enough. But God has overflowing yes. with mercy. Yeah. He has so much mercy. David thought he would be merciful, and he was right. That's how much mercy God has. Amen. Point number two is you got to embrace grace. Embrace grace. I like it. Verse 16, David looked up, saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth. With a drawn sword in his hand, extended over Jerusalem, David... And the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell face down. I mean, I would too. I mean, yeah, for sure. Never worn sackcloth, but I want to try once. <laughs> David said to God, Was it not I who ordered the fighting men to, to be counted? I, the shepherd, have sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. They have not. What have, what have they done? Lord my God, let your hand fall on me and my family, but do not let this plague remain on your people. Look at David. David David starts to embrace grace a little bit here, yeah. too. Now, to note, this is David's, 
probably second great disaster in his life. Yeah. Yeah. The, the second battle he lost and he was destroyed for it. And this is right after this, it says David got old and died. Yeah. Wow. He barely made it. Yeah. He repent. Praise God. He repented before yeah. the dis- yeah. after the disaster and before his death. Amen. Yeah. Verse 18. It says, then, then the angel of the Lord ordered Gad to tell David, go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. So David went up in obedience to the word that Gad had spoken, the name of the Lord. While Arana was, at the thresh, while Arana was threshing wheat, he turned and saw the angel. His four sons who were with him hid themselves. David approached, and when Arana looked and saw him, he left the threshing floor and bowed down before David with his face to the ground. David said to him, Let me have this side of the threshing floor so I can build an altar to the Lord, that the plague of the people may be stopped. Sell it to me at full price, Arana said to David. Take it. He didn't want that land. After seeing an angel, he's like, I don't want nothing to do with that. <laughs> Let my Lord the king do whatever pleases him. Look. I'll give oxen for the burnt offerings and threshing sledges for the wood. And the weed and the grain offering, I will give all this. But the King David replied to Aaron, No, I insist on paying full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. (laughs) In verse 22, chapter 22, verse 1, David said, The house of the Lord God is to be here. And also the, the altar of burnt offering for Israel. He dis- this terrible disaster, David's one of his two greatest mistakes, his two worst moments at that place is where God decides the temple needs to be. It's at the place of his most broken spirit. It's at his worst failure. Arguably, is where the temple is established. Wow. Yeah. What does that say about God's grace? True. That in your worst moments, God can build something great. Yeah. Wow. Come on. In your worst, most dark moment, yeah. in your most hurting, yeah. in your most sinful moment, God can turn you around yeah. and make you a temple for Him. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And let the Spirit dwell in you. Yeah. You know, it's all about Sacrifice and grace. Yeah. Yeah. Sacrifice and grace. I would say that en- that encompasses a walking temple. Would you guys? Yeah. 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 That's right. And after he received this grace and he was able to build the temple of Solomon, go to Second Chronicles chapter six. This is Solomon's prayer of dedication of the temple. And I was thinking about this verse. It's such a beautiful long prayer. And I was just thinking about this passage and how we are the temple in the new covenant. The old temple's destroyed. We are the new temple in the old covenant. This or in the new covenant, this passage is called the dedication of Solomon's temple. I would like as a challenge as a church, tonight and tomorrow morning, tonight you pray this prayer, but for yourself. Replace all the things about the temple and put yourself in there. Are you gonna be the temple today? Are you going to live as the temple tomorrow and the rest of your life? Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 6. Come on, brother. Come on, Johnny. Look at this beautiful prayer. In verse 14, Lord God, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth. You who keep the covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. Mm. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. With your mouth you have promised, and with your hand you have fulfilled it, as it is today. Now, Lord, the God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, the promises you made to him. And said, you shall never fail to have his successor to sit, on, to sit before me on the throne of Israel. And that's Jesus now, amen? Yeah. If only your descendants are careful in all they do to walk before me according to my law, as you have done. And now, Lord, the God of Israel, let your word that you promised your servant David become true. But will God really dwell on earth with humans? Will he? It's up to you. Amen. 
The heavens, even the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built, your own body. Yet, Lord, my God, give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy. Hear the cry and the prayer of your servant is praying in your presence. May your eyes be open toward this temple day and night. This place of which you said you would put your name there. Did God put his name in you? May you hear the prayer your servant prays toward this place. Hear the supplications of your servant and of your people Israel. When they pray toward this place, hear from heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. When anyone wrongs their neighbor and is required to take an oath, and they come and swear the oath before your altar in this temple, maybe they swear, they say, I'm going to repent, I promise you. They say that to you. Then hear from heaven and act. Judge between your servants, condemning the guilty and bringing down the heads what they have done and vindicating the innocents by treating them in accordance with their innocence. When your people Israel have been defeated by an army because they have sinned against you and when they turn back and give you praise to your name, praying and making supplication before you in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land to, to you give them their ancestors. When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you. And then they pray toward this place and give praise to your name and turn from their sin because you've afflicted them. Then hear from heaven and forgive their sins of your servants. Your people Israel, teach them to the right way to live and send rain on the land you give your people as an inheritance. When famine or plague comes, to the land or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, enemies besiege them in any of the cities. Whatever disaster or disease may come, and when a prayer or plea is made by any among you, your people, being aware of their afflictions and pains, spreading out their hands toward this temple, when they hear from heaven your dwelling place, forgive and deal with everyone according to all they do. Since you know their hearts, for you alone Know the human heart so that they will fear you and walk in obedience to you all the time they live in the land you gave our ancestors. As for the foreigners who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your great name and mighty hand and outstretched arm, when they come and pray toward or with this temple with you, then hear from heaven when dwell, your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks you, so that all people of earth may know your name and fear you, as do your own people Israel, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. I would, I, I would encourage you guys for the sake of time, read the rest of pray the, <laughs> Pray this prayer tonight. <laughs> And know that you can choose to be this walking temple. Yes. That people can yes. come and find yes. healing. Yes. That when people wow. pray with you, their prayers will be answered. Wow. Yes. That God actually wants you to be this temple. Yes. A living sacrifice full of grace. Yes. Easy to forgive. Come on. And easy to receive grace from the Lord. Yes. I love you guys. To God be the glory. Amen.